Hey, Dude, it is. that Smiley Kaufman for 61. Wow. I'm Smiley Kaufman, and this is The Smiley Show. Did I do this right? I got you, buddy. There we go. Get a two two box. I just want to get a two box. We in the two box? We're in the two box. Apologies for the false starts for those of you that have been tracking along with our attempts to go live here. <laughs> we uh, listen. I'm not gonna like name names, uh, streaming services out there, but it, it rhymes with the uh, Siveride and uh, the live application. Not great. Not great. I'm not happy about it. But we're here. I'm Charlie Hume. He's Smiley Kaufman. Recapping the Black Desert Championship. Uh, talking about a little college football weekend viewers in Baton Rouge. Uh, for those of you that are listening on the podcast and or watching on the YouTube now, I know many of you want to get right to the golf talk. We will get to that in a few minutes here. But as we kind of let people filter in, start watching the uh, the stream here, we're, we're going we're gonna to kind of warm it up a little bit. Smiley, you did an excellent six minutes on your trip to Baton Rouge and all sorts of fun stories that will be forever lost the time. Thanks to uh, the aforementioned streaming application. But would you care to do a version of that again? Oh yeah. Just absolutely. get people up to speed, please. Thank you so much. Well, I've already told you this story. Now I get to tell everybody. So this is even better. <laughs> so yeah, I uh, went to Baton Rouge this weekend, LSU Ole Miss. Uh, and uh, by the way, if, if you had to go to an, a wedding this weekend or had some occasion that, that mm. have, that took you away you. from a TV or any type of college football um, on October 12th. I'm sorry. Cause yesterday was one heck of a college football day. The games were incredible, uh, especially the evening ones getting started of the day uh, with Alabama, South Carolina, that game was nuts, but uh, my weekend was fun going to Baton Rouge. I try to do it once a year. And this was a great weekend celebrating a hundred years of tiger stadium. And it was an epic one. LSU Tigers get it done. But uh, yeah, so Thursday we go down, uh, stay with some friends, the land was uh, BG and Leslie. Thank you for hosting us. And uh, it was a great weekend. Friday, you know, Francie and Anna Carter kind of took them around town to our favorite spots, ate some pancakes at Louie's, took her on campus and uh, kind of was a part of everybody walking to and from class. You know, I'm telling Francie about, oh, you know, this is where I went to class here. And she's like, I don't care. I'm like, well, I'm still going to tell you. You're just going to have to listen type of situation. <laughs> and that's kind of how all Friday went. And uh, what's an incredible restaurant now in Baton Rouge called Supper Club. Brandon Landry uh, over at Walk-Ons, they, they run that place. And it's just an incredible experience as far as the dining went. And uh, then Saturday, the games, my, I mean, the tailgating was great. The weather was fantastic. Uh, like I said, 100 years of Tiger Stadium and that atmosphere was just absolutely electric. If you could tell by my voice and you've listened to the show a bunch, I'm operating at like a, you know, um, you know, battery percentage overall feels at about, you know, the low warning light is definitely on. We're probably at about 16 mm. percent capacity of where we're at. The voice is definitely below 50. Not great because I was screaming my absolute face off at the game, mainly at the refs for no reason, uh, whether they, it was warranted or not, just was trying to make an impact on the game. And if, uh, and, you know, if Wayne Kiffin could hear me, I definitely tried, <laughs> so, <laughs> but, uh, they, 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 have, they have the light show. I don't know if North Carolina is at Carly and, uh, they have like the synced up wristbands. Like you're at a, yes, amazing. You're at a T Swift concert, but the only bad thing was, and this was classic LSU fans being idiots was, uh, you know, I could say that because I am one mm -hmm. is, uh, they were throwing these things and they were throwing them like on the field okay. because I mean, these things are taking off like they're shooting stars from the top of uh, the top of the stands. I mean, these guys are throwing it a hundred yards basically in the air and they're like firm too. So guys were like getting hit by these things. Mm. So eventually over the loudspeaker, they're like, if you keep throwing this, these wristbands, First off, you'll get arrested, but also it's going to be an unsportsmanlike penalty on the team. So now everybody started throwing, everybody started booing. So that was a whole thing. But the game in itself was insane. I thought going into the game, I was worried about our defense and I thought our offense was going to be fine. Completely opposite. We uh, looked terribly offense, terrible offensively and defense 
kept the crowd in it, kept my voice in it. And at the end of the game, when we won on that overtime play, there was an option of, you know, you would think about like, should I storm the field for me mm-hmm. at that time that there was no option. I immediately didn't even ask my wife. It's like, Hey, hang right here. I'm going to go run down to the field. I was halfway down the stairs before really that ball was even caught. I mean, I'm already just love that towards the field. Cause I saw everybody else jumping on and you know, that's, that's the big debate too, which is, is it dumb to storm the field against a team that you've historically beaten, especially over the last couple of decades? And my answer is you had to be there. It was a hundred years of tiger stadium. The place was absolutely electric. One of the best atmospheres I've ever been part of there. And you know, we've, we've, you know, since 19, we've been a pretty mediocre football team. So it was fun to, you know, we'll have a top 10 win, uh, trying to build LSU back a bit. So I, I don't like field storming rules. It's yeah. just, it's just to your point, it's kind of a vibe. It's like or the you, hardos that just say that, you know, it, you shouldn't do it. It's like, I think you got to be there type of thing. Yeah. And it felt right. It was the right move. Well, it, if, if it feels right, you just storm the field, you just do it. And, and I didn't realize that it's, it's the hundred year anniversary of tiger stadium. That's a big one. It's amazing. It beautiful. And, it's amazing. and I don't think a hundred years ago, tiger stadium probably had in its, in its potential of what sounds would be playing over the intercom. And I don't think they had the light show yeah. being synced up to set it off boozy <laughs> in the first quarter. But when that, when they turned those lights off and set it off, got played. I mean, you can go find the videos. It was the place just turned into a club. Like just, it was like that. Everybody was breaking it down. I was kind of like two seats in from the aisle. So Francie's right next to me on the aisle, um, which was, you know, right down the stairs. And so I, I had to switch with Fran during the middle of this game because I needed more room, not only just to like spread out, but to dance, to yell, to scream. And to break it down, especially like when swag surfing got played in the oh, fourth quarter, love swag I got surf. my whole, you know, I, I got the whole thing, you know, I'm, I'm moving back and forth. So yes, I did lean all the way in. I felt like a college student for, for a moment. That's and amazing. Uh, yeah, that's why college sports are the best. It was, it was great to be there for a game like that. I couldn't imagine not being there. And uh, yeah, that'll be a memory for a long time. That's fantastic. I mean, you, you got to kind of we we have less and less of, of that in our tank these days, you know, so you get like one weekend where you just get to lean all the way in. Sounds like you had a great child care at home for Anna Carter. So you got to yes, just indeed. do do the whole nine yards while also taking her to see the campus earlier in the day, checking multiple boxes. So that's fantastic. Great yeah, I, I, I love it for you. I, I am. I've heard the audience loud and clear. I'm going to limit Carolina football talk other than I just have two things. The first is. Uh, nothing summed up our season better than our tight end dropping right in the bread basket, the potential game winning pass, and then kicking the tying field goal with like less than two minutes, minute and a half on the scoreboard. And then Georgia tech getting the ball back and in a situation where they're trying to run the clock out to get to overtime, allowing like a 70 yard run to their running back to, to win the game. And, and I promise you yards 40, 40 yard line in, I was just sitting on my couch laughing maniacally <laughs> while looking at my 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 two year old son and newborn daughter. My wife's like, "What is wrong with you? You're scaring the kids." I'm like, "This is this is it, man. This is Carolina football. It's so I, good." I love you know, it. I didn't know uh, they were still putting those games on cable TV. I thought they were like the pay-per-view. CW. The CW. <laughs> Here we are mocking uh, live. Wait, golf. was it really on the CW? It was on the CW. <laughs> that is where you could watch the noon kickoff, North Carolina Tar Heels. And Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets this week. I had no idea they they had football games. And, and the production quality was it was no knock on CW, but it was just like yes, this is where we this is where we deserve to be as North Carolina football. Noon on the CW, <laughs> giving up a seventy yard run with with less than a minute left I, to lose I, the football game. This, this so was kind good. of a bit, you know, just giving you giving you crap on North Carolina football, but boy. That, oh. that, that, all of that you just said was chef's kiss. That is exactly yes. what I was hoping you'd say.
it's a new era in CFP to start off this year, put on full display. My take on this game is simple. I, I know some people will be upset about it. Good riddance to the Pac-12. Can you do it in terms of the week to week to week? I don't see a pathway for this team to miss the college football playoffs. We want to make sure you have those best bets in the entirety of our betting cards. That was Tony Lincoln! But he had that he program was Tony going there. Only on SportsGrid. Guardians, despite being at home in the land, were a home underdog against Tarek Skubal. Enter Lane Thomas. Maybe one of the under-the-radar trade deadline acquisitions being dealt from the Nationals. He was huge in the ALDS. A heavy favorite for the New York Yankees in the series. You're going to look to their best two ball players to be those MVPs. That's Juan Soto and it's Aaron Judge. The early line, only on Sports Grid. Right here with you on Pro Football Today on Sports Grid. Odds in motion, trying to see what lines have moved throughout the week. Never felt more comfortable in the set than I do for this year. I am uh, ready. I'm just getting angry. The hot takes are going to be here all uh, long. People. What in the world is going on in Miami, Doc? It's not particularly anything to shy away from just because many people are on top of it. Hot take, hot take. I think this line is asking you once again to take the wounds. Pro Football Today, only on Sports Grid. If you're sliding DiVincenzo to the what? Uh, obviously, Terrence Cheney Jr., that is actually dynamic uh, offensively and defensively. So we'll see how it works. I think it's a little bit of a work in progress. Do both teams win? Yes. I don't think at the end of the day, Minnesota could have afforded to keep Cat, Rudy, and Ant for that amount of money. Betting above the rim. Only on Sports Grid. Shall we talk some golf here? So yeah. We have a new winner do it. on the PGA Tour. Uh, Matt McCarty. And this is a guy where, you know, we want to take this in a number of different directions. But we've talked a lot this last season just about, you know, these uh, the, the crop of guys coming off the Corn Fair mm -hmm. Tour, guys that are ready to make an impact right away. Uh, Matt McCarty, he earned his tour card this season via the Battlefield Promotion. Three wins on the P on, on the Corn Ferry Tour. Only the thirteenth guy to do that. And this was it, it was actually if you look at his his season on the Corn Ferry Tour this last year, if if you cut it off like the first part of the year at June second after a miscut at the UNC Health Championship, I believe I have this correct. He'd missed four cuts in twelve starts. He had two top fives, but really nothing other than that. Better than a tie for twenty sixth, and then just flipped a switch, kind of June on. He wins the Price Cutter Charity Championship uh, in, in, in late July. He wins the Pinnacle Bank Championship in mid-August. And then Albertson's Boise Open at the end of August wins that to, to stamp it, earn his tour card. Uh, this is a guy that they were showing stats here on Golf Channel after the win this week at the Black Desert Championship. Uh, one one uh, in his third start on the PGA Tour. So one of the fastest to ever do that. Um, they also showed, showed a graphic. Garrett Kigo did that a couple of years back at Congaree's second PGA Tour star. So Smiley, just reflections on a guy that looks like he stripes it pretty good. Yeah. Hit it well this week. He's, he, he's 26 years old out of Santa Clara. Grew up in Scottsdale, Arizona. So this sort of desert mountainous golf kind of suits him well. What'd you see out of Matt that makes you, you know, think of what kind of impact he could have on the PGA Tour this season? Well, I think it just kind of, shows where the depth is in the pro game. I, we talk so much about the top and, and fixing the highest level of the game. And when you see a player that, you know, is a relatively unknown player coming into the corn Ferry tour season, playing his golf at Santa Clara, it, this isn't a, a player that, you know, was playing at Georgia or playing at a, you know, a, a top school. Santa Clara is a, a school. I can't even name you another player that's played at Santa Clara. I'm sure there's probably been plenty of great players, but you know, what what comes to mind is is very light so you know for for a player like himself to to get as hot as he did you know in the middle of this corn fairy tour season the, the stat that i saw that interests me was after you know right around june 9th he was 10 under par or more in 13 straight events so this guy was just making a ton of birdies every single week so he's been playing incredible this entire summer and you know Winning's not easy, right? He won three times on that tour, which is an incre incredibly competitive tour. You said the 13th time uh, for, for a guy to do that. Uh, it's impressive. And I, I think what 
my takeaway from just watching Matt get the victory is that it's a storyline that I'm interested in. I'm interested so much in these Corn Ferry Tour players to learn more about them sooner. I feel like this Corn Ferry Tour season, when it finished, I'm ready to see this next crop on the PGA Tour. And if it weren't for Matt's Battlefield promotion, we wouldn't be seeing him unless he was getting sponsors invites. So this is a conversation I want to get into mm-hmm. um, in, a, in, a, in a second, but let's just look at the PGA Tour in this and, and, and how he fits in this ecosystem now. Right. So he j- he's now in the winner's category. He's he's not he's got no worries about his schedule now. He's got no worries of a reshuffle that he may have had to deal with next year. So he's in a great spot now that he's won, which is obvious. He's now got a master's exemption. But what does he not have? He does not have access into the signature events. Is that correct? Like he's not even in Pebble Beach. He's not in Riv. So that's the confusing thing to me about all of this, right? Is that we're having, you know, the biggest, arguably one of the biggest tournaments that the professional game offers being the masters awarding an exemption for a player winning this event in the fall, but also the PGA tour isn't rewarding players winning to getting in their own big event. So that's where the disconnect is. For me and all this, it's like, hey, I want to see Matt McCarty on Mm -hmm. the elite PGA Tour events, and I want to see these new faces playing this fall. But we're just in a a tug of war right now of trying to figure out where everybody fits. It's a game of Tetris, and right now, I just think this Tetris game is a bit confusing. It's it's every time we have some form of this conversation. We're we're running through all the various categories and trying to understand how it applies to the this fall stretch of the season that isn't really the full 2024 season, but it's a segment of it, but it doesn't count toward 2025. And of course, with this win, he gets into the century. But to your point, because he's not a card carrying tour member uh, from the 2024 PGA Tour season, along with that collection of players, he's not accruing points. We don't believe towards that next 10 category that would get him in the signature events and that first sort of swing. Um because he does have his tour card and because he'll play in the century, he will be uh, he will be starting to earn next 10 points once he plays in the century. Yes. But he won't be accruing uh, 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 swing five points unless he's in the field of the Sony. And it was interesting. We were even looking at the field list for the Shriners this next week. He was an alternate. Mm-hmm. For the Shriners this next week, prior to winning this tournament, I assume that by mm-hmm. virtue of this win, he will get in automatically the Shriners. But it's just the, the the whole thing is, I think, to drill down on a little bit in the conversations we've been having off camera, uh, it, it's looking at maybe the back half of some of these fall events. Like, I completely understand 51 through 125 or whatever, those guys that have solidly been in that top 125 PGA tour card status, that those guys are vying for that next 10 category and trying to lock down their card for the 2025 season. Like let those guys go out and play. When we get past that, I think you and I both would love to see a little more churn in that category. And and let's give these corn fairy tour guys more opportunities because they've earned it by playing on this this feeder tour and going through the grind that Corn Ferry Tour can represent, having to shoot a zillion under par each mm-hmm. week to make it. And if that means that you lose some some guys that had a tour card the year before that are 126 and beyond, so be it. Tell those guys to go play Corn Ferry Tour in 2025 and earn it back the hard way, the way these guys are, that are coming in. That's just, I, I'd like to see a little more churn there. I'm not sure. Um, I, I know you and I feel similarly on that, but do you have additional thoughts as to like how we should be doing that as it relates to the fall? Yes. Yeah, so there's things I do like about the fall. I do kind of, I think that's really intriguing kind of monitoring, you know, who's going to be the top 125, you know, at the RSM championship, which is the last one of the fall series. Mm-hmm. So it is the, cool to see an ending to the 125. So if, if we're seeing an ending at the tour championship of who's going to win the FedEx cup, which we've already debated, uh, you know, a couple episodes back, which is when should the regular season end? Should it be before the tour championship, which is separate from this conversation and that finishing the, the season at RSM, it's about the top 125 in that next 10 category. Mm-hmm. 
we're at a point in time coming off of a, a wild Saturday of college football. People are consistently peeking over at this board. He actually would not be my number one overall pick, nor would I bet him to be the number one overall pick. I think you got that next wave of NFL players, which is so enticing, which when you see Jaden Daniels coming to the NFL and you go, I can get something like that with a guy with just as good an arm. Pro football today, only on SportsGrid. It's a new era in CFP to start off this year, put on full display. My take on this game is simple. I, I know some people will be upset about it. Good riddance to the Pac-12. Can you do it in terms of the week to week to week? I don't see a pathway for this team to miss the college football playoffs. We want to make sure you have those best bets in the entirety of our betting cards. That was so the But he had that he program was going there. Only on Sports Grid. I do a sliding DiVincenzo to the what? Uh, obviously, Terrence Cheney Jr., that is actually dynamic uh, offensively and defensively. So we'll see how it works. I think it's a little bit of a work in progress. Do both teams win? Yes. I don't think at the end of the day, Minnesota could have afforded to keep Cat, Rudy, and Ant for that amount of money. Betting above the rim. Only on Sports Grid. I think the Washington Commanders are one of the best bets to win it all, or at the very least win the NFC. Their offensive line, I do want to say one thing. It's very average. The coaching is good. They're getting good coach for, good coach from Bobby Johnson, their line coach. They were from the Giants, but they've kind of overachieved. Let's call it like it is. Daniels has taken them up. Look, that division is not very good, and they could very well win it over the Eagles but and the Cowboys. They're not a Super Bowl team. Newswire, only on Sports Grid. The churn that you're talking about. This is where I always wanted to do some digging because I wanted to see, okay, if we add 30 Corn Ferry Tour rookies, which is a huge number, 30 is a big, big number to add to the FedEx Cup fall. Is that dipping too much into the churn of what we may say that, you know what, you probably didn't play well enough this season to deem yourself worthy of, you know, those additional starts to try to make that top 125. But the argument is, this is what the whole fall is about is for those players to have that second opportunity to still try to make it in the top 125 and keep their card. So looking at it, if you added 30 guys to the deal, it would go if at the Shriners open, the last guy in that would be 211 in the FedEx Cup, which it's it's not a quite a perfect math system. You can't just go minus 30 because certain guys are not playing. It actually goes down to 150. So 150 on the FedEx Cup, which I feel that's, that that's third. Just to clear that that to, to, for people to understand, that's 30 up. The last player in the field is 211, and that's 30 up from there. So that's equivalently where you'd be entering these Corn Ferry Tour guys. Where this is kind of where I've settled in on this argument, which I think that if you had going into the corn Ferry tour season, these players knowing what they're playing for, right? Like, so the first spot, you have all these exemptions that give the players championship. Now the U S open, but let's say that going into the year, they had one extra thing to play for, which is if you get into the top 10 of the corn Ferry tour list, that will exempt you into the FedEx cup fall. Now you mm -hmm. will not be able to accumulate any points, but it'll give you an opportunity to be playing for more money and status. So what did we just see this week? Matt McCarty wins the golf tournament, mm -hmm. gets status, made a whole bunch of money. Now we all know who he is. So it's a win, win, win. So we're starting to introduce some of the top players that came off of the corn Ferry tour. And the one way in which now, Hey, how do we get, you know, these players into the signature events? Cause they're not eligible to compete in the next 10 because they're not accumulating FedEx cup points. Like these players did all season, make it a, a straight battle for these 10 guys and one spot gets in to maybe the first two signature events. So you got a, a totally different storyline now to follow. You got 10 new guys playing the entire fall. And then, and then they're also battling for what would be signature events being, whether it's after the century and it'd be Riviera and Pebble. I think that would be really cool. You get to get the top 10 players. You're introduced to their storylines. I think 30 is a lot. I mean, 150 yeah. 
you know, that's that used to be the addition the conditional status 126 and 150 so that that was also a number that meant something to a pga tour member like myself so 150 and beyond that was always the spot that you kind of knew it's like you know i didn't play well enough and you kind of are subject to uh definitely other guys getting getting more opportunities yeah i would i mean there there are a number of different ways you could go about this like i this might sound extreme but i go so far as to say I would put the 30 Corn Ferry Tour graduates in a category above 126 and beyond for fall tour events. Like I would say, and I and I know that by default, what I'm saying that is you pretty much guaranteed 125 and up their their status going mm-hmm. to the next year. You've taken a little bit of the drama out of it there. But to me, it's like I just feel like the fall is a separate season, a separate product at this point anyway. And we heard last fall Jimmy Walker's complaints along the lines of, wait a second, I thought I just did what I needed to do. I was in inside the top 125 in what was the sort of regular season. Now you're telling me because I finished beyond 50, I finished 51 and beyond, I have to go out and play all these fall events that's to a, ensure that's I That's a veteran. That's a veteran it's, being mad, right? He's, right? he's used to the old, old guard of that 125. But I, I think that's one way you could clear it up in a way is say, okay, like now these guys 126 and beyond may still be able to get entry into a lot of these tournaments because of the way the fields are getting filled out and they may still catch 125 and up on that list and bump those guys and get in the back and get their status that way but you you would at least be making that old guard happy by saying we're going to put 30 guys in front of those guys because they've earned their they've earned their promotion, even though it, even though it's for 2025, they've earned their way onto this tour, and we're going to give them playing opportunities so people in the fall can tune in, see something different, see a new mix of names, familiarize themselves, and then yeah, like it probably only impacts you know 121 through 125 or something like that, and 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 you may only get a few guys who make their way to events who who can kind of play yeah. whatever, but I I, I don't. I guess what I'm, I guess what it boils down to is I don't need the fall to be I find no real intrigue. It's like, oh, I wonder if 128 is going to get into 125 and get his you know tour status next year. Like, I'd rather see young guys and fresh faces. Yes, make it me too. And, so and bad. Nail in that nail in 125 and up. Like, let the guys pretty much have it, especially if you get some real stars on this Corn Ferry tour. Like Jake I, Knapp I last year. I don't want to see, or I'm, I'm talking about some superstars. I'm talking yeah, yeah. like Ludwig Oberg, guys sure. that I, I want to see immediately play on the PGA Tour. Anyone that's been to a sporting event, the atmosphere before a game, I think Game Time Decisions has that same exact atmosphere. This is our arena. This is what we do. There is going to be an energy to game time decisions that you will feel night in and night out. The excitement you get when you when you lock your bets and when you're figuring out what you want to do, we can zone in on the biggest games each night. I want this to be the place that people come to before the games start so they feel as ready as possible to lock in their cards. We are going to hit every single one of those markets that you need to know about. We're gonna go through every single thing and I've got a great team behind me that's gonna help me get the job done. There is not gonna be a better place, I promise you, than Game Time Decisions to get that new information, react to it, and be able to then bet accordingly. We will have everything at our disposal and we will use that to our advantage. I'm Kevin Walsh, tune into Game Time Decisions from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern on Sports Grid. I do think they come back, and I think they win this game, but they've got to do it decisively. I think they've got to get that confidence back because they went out there, and like I said earlier, Kentucky almost beat Georgia. Kentucky almost uh, did beat Ole Miss, and I think what you're going to see in this conference, if you don't play well and you're a top-10 team in the SEC, you're going to get knocked out by one of those top-25 teams in the SEC uh, if you're not ready to play. Powered by SportsGrid. Guardians, despite being at home in the land, were a home underdog against Tarek Skubal. Enter Lane Thomas, maybe one of the under-the-radar trade deadline acquisitions being dealt from the Nationals. He was huge in the ALDS. A heavy favorite for the New York Yankees in the series. You're going to look to their best two ball players to be those MVPs. That's Juan Soto and it's Aaron Judge. The early line, only on Sports Grid. Yeah. <laughs> 
one of the the sort of the headlines in this past week that is very applicable to what you uh, do on a weekly basis, Smiley, is some of the new TV changes that the PGA Tour is experimenting with. We saw one of them this week that really isn't necessarily new. In, in fact, it, what it really looks like to me is mm. a borrowing of the concept that's worked for many years on the DP World Tour. It's, you know, the walk and talks that we've seen for a couple of years now on the PGA Tour, except instead of having a set of AirPods in and that player talking to broadcasters commentators are in her booth and and you're not seeing them there is a on-course correspondent holding a mic and going back and forth with that player and that is what you've seen on the dp world tour for a number of years now so that's something we saw this week at the black desert championship and then kind of two other pieces of the um just i don't know if you want to call it a, a modernization of the broadcast or just experimenting with new things but one was more of a focus on that cut line on, on, you know, really that Friday uh, coverage window of just less of a focus on the leaders and more of a who's sweating that cut line and what's that number going to be. And can we use more modern analytics and things like that to give you an accurate guess as to where that cut line is going to end up. Um, And then also a, a more of a narrow focus in the broadcast on a specific hole or a specific, you know, uh, like, you know, at the Sanderson Farms, it was yeah. like a drivable par four. Just, uh, just instead of going wide on the entire golf course, seeing a bunch of guys come through and play one section of the golf course. And Smiley, this applies to you because you know you've been doing the Fridays with Smiley at one whole location this entire last season, and you know a lot of that's been cut line focused. So, just what are your reflections on? Um, the ways in which the broadcast hopefully changes and what you're excited about to kind of see NBC sports and golf channel do from your employer's perspective. Yeah, this is all coming from the the networks, obviously listening to their audience, but also communicating with the PGA tour and their subcommittees that they have set up. So there, there are players that, that meet with the networks and also just try to formulate a plan of, of, of how to make it, more engaging, see more golfers, and just make it a different experience from day to day. So the traditional way in which we've covered golf, which is Thursday, Friday, typical featured groups, you go around the entire golf course with those, you know, two or three groups outside of some big shots that you kind of find around the golf course that that kind of gets sold. And they're like, okay, let's go over to your seven. Most of the time, you kind of know, I sit on the couch and something's about to happen. Um, The way that it's going to be this fall and the way they're, they're trying to test it out is that, like you said, you know, going to one hole, whether it be, you know, for Shriners this next week, it'll probably be the drivable far for 15th hole and then the 17th hole, which is a par three. And I think what you're going to see in this is that we're going to see most likely just about every single player that's in the field come through these holes. Mm. So instead of only seeing, let's say, 25 guys of the 144 we're going to see closer to the full field on the TV screen while you're sitting there watching. So if you're a parent or you're a cousin or you're a friend or you're a fan of X name, this player that doesn't get on TV, you know, once every five events, unless he holds out a shot, Hey, this is, this is now this fall, an opportunity to see him play, whether it be, you know, that, that drivable hole or that going forward in two or that par three. So you'll, that you'll typically see that on Thursday and then Friday, if you're, fan or friend or whatever it is is on that cut line that's going to be the storyline and and that's that's the big thing it's been echoed from the players it's like we don't show enough of our golfers in that we don't focus enough on the cut line and i could not have agreed up more on this i've always said that man it'd be cool to have some type of like a red zone experience on fridays but now we're just going to do it on the broadcast and uh saturday and sunday we've always focused on on the leaders and and setting up these storylines of who's going to win these golf tournaments but but now we have friday to really you know lean into what is one of the coolest things that we have in professional golf which is a cut you know this is what guys uh decide whether they're going to get paid or not um the not just the players, the caddies too. So it's a, it means a lot for somebody like me knowing going into every week, you know, you're, you're just trying to give yourself an opportunity on the weekend to go make a paycheck and move up, whether it's the corn Ferry tour pointless or the PGA tour FedEx cup pointless. Um, And that was our sole focus. So I love that Friday is going to be that way. I think just the graphics that I've seen this entire fall of just the rolling leaderboards of so weird seeing, you know, a 20 person leaderboard of where the cut is. You just Mm -hmm. never have seen that before. So for me, 
I'm always checking that anyways to see who's making right. the cut and who isn't. Now I get to watch it on Friday. So I think it's a, a great way to to kind of test this as we kind of move into hopefully getting people to turn on the TV on a Friday. We've talked a lot about this in this specific episode. Thanks to some of the comments we've received. But I just think it's worth reiterating is the thing I like about this the most is the YouTubification of the cover. Like, like, what do we love about YouTube golf? It's that there are personalities involved. It's that, yes, they're playing a sport that we see on television from a, from a professional perspective, but it's also it's watching a human being go about around a round of golf in the way that I might, you know, if I'm with my buddies, you know, playing at Hope Valley. Uh, I think that there is. The, the cut line to me, of course, is competitive. Of course, it folds into the tournament being played, but it's also a human interest story. And, and I think that the more that we can do to showcase the different segments of this tournament that's happening and also and I know that they're probably not leaning into this right away, but just, you know, more of this access to guys that, that are not only the top of the leaderboard, that, but they're that trying to kind of extend their career in a lot of different ways by, you know, making a cut or two or not ending up on the wrong side of the top 125. We're talking about that they're earning their tour cards at the end of the season. That stuff to me, I love. And, and I think I'm glad they're experimenting more with it. I'm glad they're experimenting with it on the broadcast and trying to get creative with that. And I, and I hope that more and more of that continues to happen because then I think that's how you, you know, people, you know, get, get, uh, they're, they're just, they're these consistent gripes of it's the same old presentation for golf on television every single year. Yeah. I love that we're trying to kind of tell stories in different sorts of ways. So I'm excited to see how this actually plays out on the broadcast this fall and hopefully beyond into 2025. Yeah. That's something on the happy hour, uh, when I've hosted this year, uh, for, for NBC, that's something that, as the year went on, I realized, hey, I have a great opportunity on a Friday to to really know when when these guys are coming through on this part three or this drivable part four, I need to know where they are in relative to the cut line. And I've tried to do that with every single player that comes mm -hmm. through. And to me, because it, it just it just gives people a reason to care about what their situation is down the stretch. So. Uh, hopefully the cut line yeah. is uh, something that is here to stay. It probably, you know, if signature events don't have cuts. We'll continue to watch the best players and feature group type coverage. But when we talk about Valero, we talk about the Cognizant. I think you're going to see this type of, you know, what we're testing in the fall. We're going to be seeing some of that, um, you know, early, early in, the, in this next calendar year. And uh, I think it'll be really good for us. But, you know, I think it, it'll be interesting. The, the interview thing, uh, Personally, from my from my side, like mm -hmm. if it was if it was me making the decisions on this, instead of having somebody just on one hole mm -hmm. and, and not knowing how, what their round has been, yeah, I I personally think it's the on course reporters that have been watching, falling with these groups, you know, just before the day, just clear it, say, all right, this guy's in. You're gonna talk to him on the 14th hole. You've already watched him play 13 holes. It's an easy interview because I just want to know about the golf course, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a little challenging, you know give doing a bunch of interviews on one hole and not really know how their round is really gone besides just seeing, okay, they're one under today, but we don't know how, you know, like we don't know exactly how it's happened. So that's, that would be my, my, um, you know, just way in which I, I think it's the easiest way to, to really give, you know, informative information, um, to, uh, to, the audience uh comment here from evan cantrell who by the way is a show og guy who's a big fan of the, the dad content on the pod so shout out to evan appreciate you joining uh with with us tonight for the for the live version of the show i'm going to take his question and i'm going to kind of transform it a little bit because this question is any chance we get a player mic'd up for a round and i think what i'm curious to hear from you smiley is in the conversations that we know these networks have had with these player councils and things like that and, and you just talked about it a little bit of having a walker who's watched an entire round with the guy asking them questions. What's the closest behind the scenes we've, we've gotten to the suggestion of a player you know, being mic'd up for the entirety of an 18 hole round? And do you think we'll ever get there? Well, I think the deal is, is that it's, it's the trust barrier. I think right. that the, the one thing that players are worried about is what they say, you know, off, you know, off camera or where the mics aren't around and that being picked up and being something that gets them canceled or gets them ruined. And
Guardians, despite being at home in the land, were a home underdog against Derek Skubal. Enter Lane Thomas, maybe one of the under the radar trade deadline acquisitions being dealt from the Nationals. He was huge in the ALDS. A heavy favorite for the New York Yankees in the series. You're going to look to their best two ball players to be those MVPs. That's Juan Soto and it's Aaron Judge. The early line, only on Sports Grid. Anyone that's been to a sporting event, the atmosphere before a game, I think Game Time Decisions has that same exact atmosphere. This is our arena. This is what we do. There is going to be an energy to Game Time Decisions that you will feel night in and night out. The excitement you get when you when you lock your bets and when you're figuring out what you want to do, we can zone in on the biggest games each night. I want this to be the place that people come to before the game start so they feel as ready as possible to lock in their cards. We are going to hit every single one of those markets that you need to know about. We're gonna go through every single thing and I've got a great team behind me that's gonna help me get the job done. There is not gonna be a better place, I promise you, than Game Time Decisions to get that new information, react to it, and be able to then bet accordingly. We will have everything at our disposal and we will use that to our advantage. I'm Kevin Walsh. Tune into Game Time Decisions from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern on Sports Grid. You can't sometimes look at the point spreads and just, you know, understand what they mean. Because going into the game, you're looking at it, it's like, okay, Denver's playing better football. They've won a couple in a row. Now they're going back home. The Broncos have to turn around and play on a short week. Sean Payton is returning to New Orleans. The Saints just gave up almost uh, 600 yards of offense to the Buccaneers. So, it's going to be an interesting kind of gut check. Newswire, only on Sports Grid. There are recent comments from Rory McElroy. So, Kyle Porter used to work for CBS, did some fantastic golf coverage there, recently left, launched his own newsletter called Normal Sport. Uh, he's written a couple of books, uh, just kind of poking fun at the absurdity of the game of golf and all the situations it puts us in, uh, using that sort of normal sport branding. It's now branched off to write his own newsletter called Normal Sport. Uh, worthwhile read, opened up with the Rory McIlroy Q&A, and, and now had a cool on this last week, Jamie Kennedy, who's produced a lot of stuff for the DP World Tour. Uh, and so as part of that Rory Q&A, uh, near the end of it, Kyle kind of flipped it for Rory and said, hey, uh, we do a lot of question asking of you. Is there anything you'd like to ask me or us as a member of the media? And I don't want to take Rory out of context here, so I'm just going to read you a collection of his thoughts on this topic. So Rory says, there's certain people in the game that I would say, how can I put this? We're all in this together, right? We're all in the game of golf together. We all want to push it forward. And I always wonder why some people in the media ask questions that have a negative connotation toward golf or make golf look bad or put it in a bad light. I get it. I get that it's human nature and negativity sells. And that's why CNN is the way it is. And that's why Fox News is the way it is and all that stuff. But if we're all in this together and we all know that we can benefit by raising the game up, some people in the media, I'd love to ask why their golf coverage is so negative. And he goes on to clarify that he's not, He's not saying you can't critique someone for playing poorly. He says, if someone messes up and you have to be critical of someone, absolutely. I think that's a part of it. I think I, more than anyone, understand that. I know that. Not saying being critical of players. I'm saying being critical of the overall game of golf. I think it's more to do with the coverage of, I guess it's true, but viewership's declining, and this is bad, and that's bad, and they hate the fans, and they hate this. I understand where they're coming from, but surely it's in everyone's best interest to focus on the positives of the game where recreational golf has never been better. There's more opportunities to play the game, just stuff like that. Sometimes I wonder what their incentive is to be so negative at times. A lot there to break down from Rory, but just I think you're a perfect person to pose this to as someone who's played on the PGA Tour, who has won a PGA Tour event and now it holds a microphone and works these events on the media side. You know, what do you what are your initial reactions to what Rory said here? Well, you know, let's start with just live golf, right? Like before live golf was here, you know, I, I think there was probably a way in which the tour was, they were set too much in their own ways, too much in, in the traditional golf, not wanting to really change Live golf comes along and totally bulldozes, you know, the traditional golf model. They they've, 
you know, try to reach an audience that is that wants change. They they like to see things that are done a little differently, and so they they have found you know an audience that does like this format, the shotgun start, you know, fifty four holes, everything that we knew about golf in just a different way. Um, but what do where are we at right now in this game? And I think this just from a network side and somebody that works for a network uh, would. You know, we're just constantly looking at ratings, seeing that those are down. So naturally, they're trying to find a way. It's like, okay, well, what's the easiest way to get ratings up? It's like, well, you try to get the best players playing together. And so the from a player side, that's what Rory McIlroy, he's trying to do more of. He wants for the schedule to be a little bit more diverse and global. Uh, from a monetary financial standpoint, could be a bit of an issue the more global you get. The, the PGA Tour has found a way uh, to, you know, have these guys playing for a lot of money. And I, that's where I kind of am going to weave this conversation on this is that the players, they're getting paid more than they ever have. You can look at it in every bucket. I think that the Live Golf players, heck yeah, they're talking great about the Live Golf Tour. You know why? They're getting paid a lot of money, more double, triple, quadruple, more than they've ever made. And and the ratings don't say that they should be making that much. So it's a bubble that we're kind of dealing with right mm -hmm. now. We have PGA Tour players that are making absurd amount of money. And whether you think they should be making that much and that the ratings and what we should probably judge based off of how many people are actually watching and is this sustainable long term as far as what these purses are asking or excuse me, what these purses are are given out to the PGA tour players and, and what these sponsors on the PGA tour are getting in return to go to a, say a Wells Fargo and say, you know what, uh, if you're going to be our title sponsor, we're going to need, you know, you, you've given us $10 million mm -hmm. a year, but this purse actually needs to be 25 now. And let's say the ones that have been 20 and, and trying to get that extra $4 million. And, and what are you getting? You're, you're getting the mm -hmm. exact same. There's no value adds besides, you know, just a, saying that, Hey, instead of uh, that Roy McIlroy wasn't going to be at your event, we can guarantee you that these guys are going to be there, but it's still a, a game that is, it's still got a, a, a kink in the armors at the professional level. So the, I can understand why Rory's like, everybody needs to, to be nicer about where the game of golf is and that it is a great game, but we're a podcast. We get to <laughs> we get to talk about how how feelings are from the fan side and and that all the things that new do need to get fixed because guess what? They do. And we're going to keep talking about them. Well, and and I think the I don't know if I want to call it ironic, but the interesting thing when you're looking at this is that you know, and, and maybe maybe it's just Rory's opinion or or anyone's opinion as to what any golf podcast, what their function is in this space and what they're supposed to be doing. Are they supposed to be commenting strictly on golf performance that happens on the golf course? Are they supposed to be talking about golf at large from a business perspective? Are they supposed to be talking about just the professional game? Are or they supposed to be talking laws. about <laughs> <laughs> or, or antitrust laws, you know, or the grassroots part of the game? Like what, what role are any of us supposed to fill? I think that's the antitrust thing is actually, it's perfect that you bring that up because, you know, we found ourselves launching this podcast in, you know, May, 2023 and months later, being like, what on earth have we signed up for here? Because we're, we're thinking about things and talking about things that we never in a million years thought we'd have to talk about as part of the show. And so I say all that to say, if Rory is okay with critique of a player's performance that is happening on the golf course, because he's saying, Hey, you know, it's, it's a game of golf. You know, there's a par you have to shoot. There's a, a leader of the tournament. If they come up short and they do it by means of bad strategy or bad execution, that's all fair game. Like, is it not also okay to look at the state of a league and the decisions they're making to grow their product in, in whichever direction they're trying to go and say, hmm, I don't know if I would have made that decision because that has clearly hamstrung that league in terms of growth or in terms of, you know, providing a, a product to a fan that people want to sign up to pay for.
can't sometimes look at the point spreads and just, you know, understand what they mean. Because going into the game, you're looking at it, it's like, okay, Denver's playing better football. They won a couple in a row. Now they're going back home. The Broncos have to turn around and play on a short week. Sean Payton is returning to New Orleans. The Saints just gave up almost uh, 600 yards of offense to the Buccaneers. So it's going to be an interesting kind of gut check. Newswire, only on Sports Grid. Anyone that's been to a sporting event, the atmosphere before a game, I think Game Time Decisions has that same exact atmosphere. This is our arena. This is what we do. There is going to be an energy to Game Time Decisions that you will feel night in and night out. The excitement you get when you when you lock your bets and when you're figuring out what you want to do, we can zone in on the biggest games each night. I want this to be the place that people come to before the games start so they feel as ready as possible to lock in their cards. We are going to hit every single one of those markets that you need to know about. We're gonna go through every single thing and I've got a great team behind me that's gonna help me get the job done. There is not gonna be a better place, I promise you, than Game Time Decisions to get that new information, react to it, and be able to then bet accordingly. We will have everything at our disposal and we will use that to our advantage. I'm Kevin Walsh. Tune into Game Time Decisions from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern on SportsGrid. Guardians, despite being at home in the land, were a home underdog against Derek Skubal. Enter Lane Thomas. Maybe one of the under-the-radar trade deadline acquisitions being dealt from the Nationals. He was huge in the ALDS. A heavy favorite for the New York Yankees in the series. You're going to look to their best two ball players to be those MVPs. That's Juan Soto and it's Aaron Judge. The early line, only on Sports Grid. Maybe where I would give Rory a little bit of, of the benefit of the doubt, right? Understand where he's coming from is it's a lot more clear cut on a golf course. You know, you know what par is, you know what they're shooting in relation to par. You can see it all playing out in front of you. Like I'm not sitting in a room with Yasser and Jimmy Dunn and Ed Hurley or whoever else, or, you know, yep. like, like, I don't know what's happening in there. I don't understand. I don't know. You know, all these negotiations, it's hard to say they should have done this. They should have done that. Cause like, I'm not privy to any of that. Um, but I think it's, I think some of the negativity, I, I, maybe I'd say it this way is that I understand why there are factions of people that are very upset with the way things have gone in the world of golf for the past few months or years or whatever it is, because they're, they're, looking at a thing they love and it's not going the way they want it to. And they're what they're expressing is frustration, but it's also, it, it's born out of a place of love of like, I want this thing to do well. And it stinks that it's not, I, you know, I don't, I, I think we choose to approach it maybe in a little bit of a different way. Like we're getting a little meta now, but I think it's like, we're looking at this and we're willing to critique, but also I think that maybe there's part of us that says, yeah, but like, how can we spin this forward? How can we, you know, what's the positive way we can kind of work out of this and get to the end goal where we want to go for this game, even if we have to make some realistic concessions along the way. But that's just the way we're wired. And I understand why other people are wired a, a different way. Um, it's just, it's all, it's very interesting. I, I think, I think it's, it's a interesting discussion point Rory comes up with. And I wonder right. how many other players think and feel that same way. Uh, I've done a lot of Q and A's this year and, and when I always open it up to questions to the crowd, the first thing that is talked about, and it's in most of the time, the question, is, it's not even a question. It's more of just a, a, a general comment. And it's always about live golf and the anger that this person speaks with. It's, it's a frustration that they don't want the game of golf to be hijacked by the Saudis. Mm. And I think that that is where I think of this big divide of, you know, the Saudis potentially buying the sport. And I think that scares a lot of people. And I think that it turns off um, plenty of fans. Yeah. I, and, and I look, I can understand that, but I, I think to kind of, there, you also kind of have to be realistic about the way the world works and, and you can also you can money, like, like money wins <laughs> money <laughs> wins in a lot of cases and that's where we found the the middle ground in all of this <laughs> right. right i think rory figured it out because remember where he was on the side of the coin he's like yeah. i'm not like terrible product yep. never be a part of it and then 
all of a sudden we had this 180 from Rory. We're like, what is going on? You and I are texting each other. Like, is this actually Rory? Because he was so on the other side of on the PGA tour side being the one that's carrying the flag. And then all of a sudden, you know, they're on the opposite side of it. So, uh, but he, but what he realized is like, we can't, we can't beat the Saudis. Like money is going to win in this. So you have to find a way to uh, meet in the middle ground and, you know, Jimmy Dunn tried to do it. Ed Hurley tried to do it. And uh, they did have that deal, that June 6th deal. And in looking at it now, who knows? That could have been the right deal at the right mm-hmm. time. And now I think it's going to be a game of leverage as we move forward because until a deal is done with the PIF, right, it's going to be the, you know, the, the Saudis trying to find a way in which they're going to have leverage against the PGA Tour. That's all we got, though. That's all we got. That's all we got. And I got to say, you know, this is also I got to give a shout out to Craig W here, because even though, you know, Craig has strong thoughts on some things as part of the show, enjoys the show. And we appreciate you chiming in in the comments and and telling us what you think. We want everyone to do that and and everyone to kind of stimulate an ongoing conversation and debate. This is lots of fun stuff. So appreciate everyone watching and listening, as always. Hope to do more of this uh, in the near future. Uh, We both need sleep in a bad, bad way. Yes. Um, yes. So uh, I feel I feel kind of bad for Fran tonight as I mm. I do think as someone who's not you know every, every guy says they're like oh yeah, you know I'm not a snorer but you know like I'm I do think tonight could be an issue I think I'm gonna be a bit of a problem I think I'm gonna struggle with oxygen uh, kids so I think I'm gonna be working pretty hard sleeping <laughs> that's uh, hate to hear that for Fran and uh, uh, we'll, we'll see how I net out I've just been like jolted away with an, an eye mask on every hour and a half to change diapers so I'm just like I'm at that ready just not not usually but <laughs> when the newborn is like staying awake and lights are going on and mm. I'm trying to kind of get sleep where I can night mask is I, I broke it out at the hospital and I was surprised as I noted on the show last time at how well I slept. That's I maybe said, a wait play a second. in the hospital. That's a good play. I was like, wait a second. Maybe I should get back to being a night mask guy. Didn't okay. hate that. Noted. Noted. So night mask pod. There you have it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank, thanks everyone for joining us we hope to do it again soon and smiley i'm gonna try to do the outro i'm gonna hopefully not botch this badge oh gosh so let's <laughs> lay him off keyboard cat <laughs> <laughs>